Hi everybody and welcome to our special rap party for the first season of Gentleman Jack. The wonderful, brilliant perfection of a series that we had to celebrate. I mean, at, at the same time, but I mean, also... Could you not recognize <laughs> us? I'm sorry I didn't dye my hair blonde, especially for the occasion. I was and I couldn't get a, ta a top hat over my toilet yeah. paper roll, so... <laughs> Uh, and and I, I admit I don't have a top hat, but I have many, many But hats. we probably will have a top hat now, as many of you must already be on the market for a top hat. Anyway, I'm Yolan Coir. And I'm Mimi Torture. And we're Lady Parts TV. And we've been talking to you about this, se this uh, series the entire season, and we could not dedicate, uh, we could not not dedicate, dedicate an a entire one. episode yes. to the great Ann Lister and Ann Walker and... At all. Yes. And Sally Wayne. And Sally Wayne and Saran Jones and Sophie Rundle. Oh my god. Etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is Jack. this is gonna be a celebration and at times might we might be shedding a little tear. Um spoiler alert. Huge spoiler alert. I know that some of you out there in the world have not seen the whole season yet, especially the ones in you in the UK. We're going to discuss the whole season, whole season, including the finale. So if you're not interested in spoilers, if you haven't seen the whole thing yet, please Pinch, put, a, put a pin in this. Put a pin in us. And <laughs> and watch it later after you're done. Um, I just have to, first of all, sigh. Do a huge, joyful, huge of pleasure, mm. a full of pleasure sigh to just express my... Oh, God, I love this show so The much. admiration, the love, the joy, the sorrow, no. the emotions. It was the, First of all, it was done... To perfection. Uh, Saran Jones deserves every award out there. Uh, Sophie Rundle was magnificent. Everybody in it plays their part to perfection. The production values are glorious and it is a great sweeping lesbian romance. What and could be better? So what you did now is basically you laid out everything that we're going to now delve into in detail. Exactly. This is, this is <laughs> sort of a, a forward. And thank you to everybody who sent in your fan art, your surveys, your emails. We're going to do all of that, and we're going to start with a discussion. Um, but before we do, I want to say, I, I want to read out what I wrote as a, why is this show magic? Because I was trying to understand, you know, it's, it's like lightning in a bottle. Mm -hmm. Every now and then comes along something that just hits that special nerve on everybody. It's not just some of them like it, some of them don't like it, some think it's great, some think it's okay. Everybody, Everybody is, is over obsessed the moon. Mm -hmm. to the over degree the of, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very rare occasion. And every element of it uh, coalesces into this, this diamond-like perfection of a whole. And so I wrote down why, why I think this happened, why it has such an impact on so many of us, uh, the, the combination of many things, but I think it comes down to Lesbians are, lesbians are used to living their lives very hungry and most of the time we get little crumbs here and there, sometimes we have to throw them up afterwards because they ruin it in the end, but this is a fully satisfying meal. In every way. It, first of all, it's, it, it's, it's about a well-rounded character who happens to be a lesbian, but she's also many other things. Yes, she happens to be a woman, which at that time, uh, all that she is, is also a uh, Completely unusual, unusual, and yes, yeah. out of its out of time and place. So, but at the same time, this is what we always say: we want the character to, for the for the gay part of her to just be part of her life, but still have enough other aspects to make her interesting and layered and complex. And this is the definition is of that. The, exactly. At the same time, she's unapo unapologetically, unashamedly, very much lesbian and the show it's very central to the show her Absolutely. lesbian completely mm -hmm. uh, there's a very central lesbian love affair that answers all the epic love stories ever told the, the tropes and the the it echoes know, them yes what uh -huh. we're used to she has she associates with other lesbians uh both as friends and as lovers which is something that oftentimes doesn't happen when we have a lesbian in a show she doesn't have a community and even in the 1800s she managed to have a community um she's gossiped about yeah we see both the joys and the struggles, so we don't see just a story that goes in one no, direction. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a fairy tale, but on the other hand, it's also not a tragedy of like, oh, you know, no, it's she's life. a lesbian, so she needs to be punished. It's life. 
Um, it's her life, and as we know, it is her life. It's an actual taken true story. from di her diaries, almost word for word. Uh, she is an inspirational character. She's a lesbian, and she's also, I think, inspiring to anybody who would watch it, lesbian or straight. Um, and she, she is portrayed with the love and the respect and the admiration of everybody who worked on this show, and it's palpable. The love that they have for this character, the honor that they feel in being able to be bring her story, and the responsibility that they feel in, in telling her story, I think, is palpable in every aspect because of the show. Because she was so brave. I mean, she, she and we know uh, from certain um, conversations she has at moments of vulnerability that it... It doesn't come easy. It didn't come easy. Right. But she insisted on being who she was at every moment. Uh, she suffered for it. She also um, won mm -hmm. because of it. Um, she was admired and respected and be ridiculed and um, uh, shunned. But mostly, I think she was respected. And finally, I also have to mention the just the... the pure art of this show, the writing, the acting, the costumes, the light, the, 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 the cinematography, setting, everything the set, about the show is, is a piece of art. And um, I think that when all these aspects come together, we kind of go nuts. Don't we? It, it wouldn't work if even one of them were out of place to the extent that it works. Mm -hmm. it, you're so drawn into it, to, to the reality of it, that you can just lose yourself in it. And that's the best kind of... Uh, Art, entertainment, you're drawn into it. You're taken into that world. You leave your world behind. Um, you become completely immersed. And immersed. I think that's what happened mm -hmm. to everybody here. It's, and that's another aspect that the cult shows and show that shows that have cult following have in uh, common that they have a world. And this world, because it's the 1800s, it's a little different to our world. And it is a world that it's inviting on this show and you want to live in it with these people. Um, if, if only they had indoor plumbing. <laughs> So um, now I want to quote some of your uh, responses. And first, let's uh, quote some people about the LGBTQ and the, the, the women empowerment uh, aspects of this show. Okay. And let's start with Lynn. Lynn says, A major thing I love about the approach to the love story in Gentleman Jack is that unlike so many preceding stories featuring lesbians, is that this is very obviously told without the male gaze. Very good observation. Very, uh, very good observation, very true, and makes it different uh, from others. Uh, the male gaze in mind, she says. There is a beautiful intimacy that is soft and gentle without the explicitness or gratuity that is often typical in some lesbian and bisexual female relationships in many shows or films. Uh, nobody had sex with high heels on. <laughs> uh, there's an utter joy and respect shown to the characters and actors in the writing and directing of the intimacy between Anne and her lovers, past and present. Touch is a wonderful act of intimacy, without it always being sexual or perceived as such. Vulnerability as well speaks volumes in intimacy between partners, allowing oneself to feel the emotion that is so strong. And I, I want to say that oftentimes I find that what is really appealing to me in lesbian stories is that forbidden love aspect that makes it so tantalizing and so much more exciting. And uh, it works in different settings. I mean, you know, nowadays it's, it's less forbidden, thank goodness, so you don't have too many stories that are contemporary about that. But in the 1800s, obviously, it was. And everything was done so tasteful on this show, um, which both gave us enough to enjoy, but also left a lot to the imagination. Mm -hmm. Lily says, It's difficult to explain why I have such strong feelings about this show. It may be because I can identify myself in the characters, their speeches, their experiences. It may be because it echoes where I am in my life right now, or something else inexplicable. But this show deeply touched and moved me. I feel a special bond, strong and strange at the same time with this show. Even if it takes place in the 19th century, this show is so modern and addresses universal themes such as identity quests, self-acceptance, the notion of norm and how to live when you don't really fit in, oppression and rejection, the rights and the roles of the women in society, the homophobia is sadly a very actual topic, the place of women in business, the possibility to have a career and break the unfortunately famous glass ceiling are also current problems of our societies. 
Regarding this, Ann Lister was definitely a pioneer as she fought against, in, against injustice and discrimination way before we did. Once again, if you didn't have your own money, the only thing you could hope for was a good marriage. Yep. Or a marriage Or a marriage, all. exactly. A exactly. marriage period. There was nowhere for you to go, nothing for you to do. And uh, I think a lot of us could see ourselves in Anne again, even this, if, if, <laughs> centuries later, uh, still dealing with the same insecurities, um, our place in society uh, to a greater or lesser degree, but still we're all dealing with a self-acceptance journey that we're all on. And she, she's, again, so inspiring. And at the same time, when she breaks and she tells us, you know, this is not easy for me. I, I'm good at putting on a face as if it's easy for me because I have to. I have to break through it, but it's not easy. And I, I know that they're talking about me. I know how they feel about me. Um, and I think that in that moment, we all kind of broke a little bit, broke down with her as well. Um, now you have some comments about Anne Lister herself, uh, more of course when, when we read out the survey replies, but uh, I think that Sarah really summed it up when she said, the thing about Anne Lister that really excites me is that while she has protective walls up when it comes to the negativity aimed at her, she remains, she remains uncompromising and bravely open to life, to love, to experience. That is truly remarkable. This is what I would love to acquire for myself and hope to learn from Anne in all the subsequent reading I have waiting for me. And I think she put it so well because it's true. As, as, as much as she's protective of herself, she's also so open and curious and wants to love. And she wants to learn everything, know everything, how things work, the insides of things, the inside of the brain. Oh, please. The Julie, scope of the world. <laughs> Julie, who was fabulous and sent me a whole bunch of information on Anne, uh, she actually, she had, Anne had like body parts delivered to her for uh, for her to do um, surgeries on and <laughs> cadavers and things. Well, as, crazy, uh, crazy stuff. As uh, one, of the, one of the characters said, she fancies herself a doctor. Yes, and I think that in a different world, and that's going, you know, at some point we'll get to your surveys. In a different world, she probably would mm -hmm. be, be a doctor or mm -hmm. would like to be a doctor. Um, and also, uh, Lily also says, I never thought I could be so obsessed with just watching a woman walking. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not just walking, baby. The way Ann Lister walks is almost a character for itself. And generally, I do not pay any attention to hairstyles, but here it is impossible not to talk about it. This improbable hairstyle that Ann Lister ha has... And I love this. Thank you, Lily. A kind of 19th century Princess Leia. Isn't it genius? Yes, it is. Perfectly designed not to be dis disordered by putting on a, her, top, her hat. top hat. The hairstyle as well as the top hat, the high-necked coat, and the walking have clearly become the defining elements of Anne Lester. That's another thing. She is Physically. so unique. Yes. She's so striking. And I love the idea of the 19th century Princess Leia. That's how I think of her. No, I don't. I, I, <laughs> well, in I some aspect. Now, of course, about Saran herself. Oh, Saran. Let's Saran. start with <laughs> Saran. Oh, sorry. You're going to read Lily's thing out, but I'm just going to have to tell you, I spared you about 50 repetitions of that. <laughs> so, go ahead. <laughs> so, Lily says, and I can hear her voice echoing softly. With a French accent, you have to Oh, with a French really want, accent. Yes. Oh, and I'm <laughs> Oh, and I'm sorry for that too, but I have to say it. Actually, Lily, she speaks French. I don't know what country you're from, but so anyway. sorry. I can't, I can't, yeah. Saran Jones, Saran Jones, Saran Jones. Really? That's how you saw it? Saran Jones. I thought it was like, Saran Jones, Saran Jones, oh. Saran Jones. I, that's how I saw oh, it, and especially but, since there were about 50 of them. I mean, there are exclamation <laughs> points, but to me, when I think of her, I think of her... Yeah. Okay. Okay. You know, but I can also see Saran Jones. See, this Saran is the difference. Jones, Saran Jones. And there Saran you have Jones. it. See, this is the greatness of an actress. It's all in, interpre in their interpretation. There are words on a page, but how you interpret it is what it is. Exactly. And this is exactly what Saran is all about, right? It is. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know how I lived until now without knowing Saran Jones. That's because you didn't go back and listen to our previous podcast right. and wrote, read our well, previous we blogs. We, you would have known. things to watch. You would have known. Yes, because we have been in love I've been, I've, with Saran's work and, and the first very time, much uh, Sally uh, and Sally's work and, and uh, have felt such great respect and um, admiration for Saran for such a long time. I think if you go back to 2013, I have a blog post about Sally and Saran. So don't say I didn't tell you. 
Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm going to go back and say, I don't know how I lived until now without knowing Saran Jones. She is resplendent, magnifique, extraordinary, <laughs> astonishing. I'm totally in love with her. Hmm. Are you? <laughs> yes, I think you are. And the way she embodies Ann Lister. She is Ann Lister. She delivers a performance of a rare intensity and incredible authenticity. And by the way, the next Emmy ceremony is canceled. <laughs> There's no point in having it as Gentleman Jack, Saran Jones, and Sophie Rundle are going to win all the Emmys. They deserve all the awards. From your mouth. To goddess's ears. Well, for, fortunately, for a few other actresses, especially who we like, there are different categories. Yes. Uh, so and, and we won't cancel the Emmys. And anyway, we want to see them <laughs> walk on stage and receive their awards I or want accolades. I want to walk on stage and Lister walking. <laughs> well, that would be fun. Uh, I, I, like, like Ann Lister in a dress? That's how I wanted to go up and get... No, but... Um, and also Carla reminds us that the BAFTAs... Uh, there's the Golden Globes. Yes, I um, said the BAFTAs immediately. That yes. They're going to just, I think, sweep the BAFTAs. I hope. I, I don't I don't have trust in any awards no, anymore. So they're also political. Uh, Bridget just would like to say, I just adore Saran Jones. Adore. I just had to express that to people that get it. I think everybody who's watching this gets it. Gets it. it. Um, some other little uh, bits. Um, I think many of you are planning your trips to Yorkshire now and are booking your tours of Shipton Hall. I think they're seeing a huge surge in huge. Uh, interest. <laughs> huge. Um, Dawn says she loves the Gentleman Jack song, the theme song. And uh, Lynn has a bit of information. Lynn, uh, by the way, has a lot of information. And I'm going to give you a link to her blog post. Uh, she, a very, very good blog post with a lot of information in it and her general impressions of the, uh, the series. And um, Lynn is fantastic at gathering information. She is. Um, so, Yorkshire, Yorkshire folk wife duo Heidi Tito and uh, Belinda Ohuli who, by the way, I think are expecting their first child. Tito and Ohuli. Right. Uh, wrote and performed the show's closing tr title track, Gentleman Jack, uh, which uh, was on their The Fragile album in 2011. The two have been touring and selling out venues around the UK, and their album The Fragile has also been soaring to the top of folk charts. The, Let's the, talk the about effect. the impact of this show. Yeah. And I love the story of, actually, because I didn't realize that they had uh, written and recorded this song long before this show. Uh, they just learned about Ann Lister, were fascinated by her, and wrote, uh, wrote a song. And Sally Wainwright happened to see a show, uh, saw them performing, loved the song, and asked to and have it in there. Yeah. And who says no to Sally Wainwright? Who says no to Sally <laughs> Wainwright, especially if you have a brain in your head. And the rest is history. Uh, I love the song. I think it's perfection. The it, entire thing. I can't believe it wasn't written for the show. Well, it was written about Ann Lister, so it makes a whole well, lot I know, of sense. But I mean, specifically, it just captures the essence of the show so brilliantly. Yes. The, the, the music works so well. Right. Uh, it, it's the, the, the rhythm and the tem up-tempo beat, but at the same time, it has heart and it has... It's exactly the show. It's exactly the feel of the show. It's the great. Right. Um, and uh, Lily says... Lily says, I usually absolutely hate when, it, when characters talk directly to viewers through the camera. Breaking the fourth wall seems to be the correct expression. It is. it is. But it's so well done in Gentleman Jack that I really look forward to these moments of direct complicity between Anne and us, the viewers. I am totally with you. I usually hate that. Yeah, and in too. fact, the first episode when she did it the first time, it kind of jarred me. Mm -hmm. But I've come to see those moments, especially because it's a diary. Mm -hmm. I've come to see those moments as an intimate Special moment between her and, and us, us. Mm -hmm. that she kind of... lets us in on. She yeah. lets us in on a little secret. Because this is what her diaries are about. She's letting us in on her secrets. And I just, I, I love that we have that connection that she doesn't have with the rest of the people, the players around her. Uh, because you know that she has so much going on in her head that she never shares with people. Uh, she looks at them, she examines them, she studies them, and she makes mental notes. And then she shares and some she of them makes, with us. And she makes physical <laughs> notes. Later on, yes. Millions of words of them. Um, also, I would like to mention um, Anne Choma, who is the writer who transcribed uh, Anne Lister's diaries. And again, Lynn gives us information. Anne Choma's 30-year history of working on transcribing Anne Lister's diaries, upon which she wrote her master's thesis on Anne Lister and the Split Self, 
uh, a critical study of her diaries, uh, University of Leeds Publishing, a hugely helped from the basis upon which Wainwright's series, uh, utilizing roughly 300,000 words from Lister's diaries focusing on the period of 1832 to 1834 for the first series. Her companion book to the series, Gentleman Jack the Real and Lister, has currently reached Amazon's bestseller list in multiple countries. I'm so glad that Anne Choma is being financially rewarded <laughs> for uh, her life's work, basically. Yeah. I, I think it's, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for doing that. Yes. Just thank you. I can't say more than that, really. Just thank you. And um, uh, you, when you think about transcribing all these diaries in the code, um, and then what Sally Wainwright did is she had to work with all this, I mean, there was so much information in there, which is was, was both, you know, the, the love affairs, but also extremely uh, scientific information about the coal and all this other stuff. And she had to take that and make it work into a drama. And, and boy, I, did she. And I think that um, Sarah just gives us a small example as to how her interpretation and her work on these diaries really, really um, was special in translating it into the screen. Um, I can't wait to see what comes next. Sarah says, for those who haven't clued in yet, Anne was very specific with her time notations in her journals and letters. Thus, Anne in the series is constantly looking at her watch, which is commented on at one point, mm -hmm. so that she always knows exactly what time things happen, which she would then notate precisely in her diary. She was a little OCD. A well, little. <laughs> uh, remember in episode one when, after sex with Mariana, she wiped her fingers, details, <laughs> checked her watch, and wrote in her diary? She not only kept track of time in all events, even the mundane ones, she kept a log of all her sexual encounters in great detail. Oh, thank you, Anne. Yes, indeed. The first, <laughs> well, it wasn't the first part, we know. From, <laughs> we know from um, uh, lots of things, including Fingersmith, that there mm. was a, oh, yes. there a was great a deal of uh, porn in that period. But, uh, but again, I think that uh, we, we have to also give credit to Sally, not only for writing a great drama, but for taking all this insane amount of Mass information. Mass amount of information. And, and, and doing just the right balance. Distilling of, it to yeah, perfection. But at the same time, the love affairs, but also when you hear um, Ann Lister going to great speeches about coal and measuring and weights and wah! And by the way, kudos to Saran for actually remembering those speeches. Well, you know, if you can remember uh, things when you're in a... a a doctor. Terms in, a, in a medical Well, doctor. and you hear how they would write things all over their patients because exactly. they couldn't remember exactly. meningio meningioma and whatever. And I'm, <laughs> I'm very happy, actually, that they didn't know uh, until after the series was done uh, that they were going to get another season because we got a complete and completely satisfying show with a, an ending that couldn't have been better. And speaking of the finale, we are about to embark now on the discussion of the finale. But before we do, I have a few um, a few follow ups on our first vlog that we did on uh, Gentleman Jack because many of you have commented on it and emailed us. And there were some comments that I wanted to first of all that I I wasn't aware of at the time and I would like to respond to now. And uh, a few things that are interesting. A few of your comments were in, in, you know insightful. Um, so. First of all, some background on Anne's finances. Uh, again, a courtesy of Lynn, which I wasn't aware of at the time. Um, you have that I sort of figured it out. Oh, I do? Yep. Ooh. Surprise! Oh, there it is. Hello. Anne had suffered the humiliation of re returning to Halifax instead of further travel to the continent due to financial constraints. While she was vastly intelligent and moved in higher circles, social circles, Anne Lister was not a wealthy woman. Though Anne is very charismatic, her social foibles sometimes get the best of her in upper-class social circles, leaving an impression that is not always positive. Her gender nonconformity to certain tasks, such as collecting the rents, owning land, opening coal pits, as well as her other business ventures, make her an oddity to the folk of Halifax and surrounding areas. And her sister Mary, yes. as her sister Thank you. Uh, as her sister Marion points out, Anne's behavior may be all well and good in places like Paris or York, but Halifax is a smaller place and people talk, and it's not always good. She'd inherited a moderate agricultural estate, along with property in Halifax and shares in various industries from her uncle, James Lister, upon his death. Thank you for that information, Thank Lynn. You. 
Also, another comment that a couple of you made were that we were all fawning over how much we loved Anne Lister and how fabulous she was, but there were aspects to her that were a little harsh. Yes. Uh, she was a snob. There's We've no said question that, about though. that. We've said that. We've mentioned that. Uh, she was. She could be rude. She could be patronizing. Yes. Um, and uh, but I but but yes, all that is true. But I love Sarah's take on that. Yes. And anyway, let me just say myself. She was human. Uh, of course, of course. So she had to have human foibles. Uh, Sarah says, about how Anne treats her servants. It occurred to me the other day that Anne Lister is a lot like Henry Higgins from Pygmalion, Oh My Fair Lady. She treats everyone with the same direct, expectant energy, whether servant, friend, enemy, or family. Very good observation. Mm -hmm. She may have different feelings for individuals and thus adjust her behavior accordingly, one-on-one. -on -one. But overall, she plows through life as she strides down the street or through a crowded room in the same direct manner. And that is how she conducts her interactions with most people. There is no denying she is a snob. She re reveres people with higher social status, but for how they but for how they live. But for how they live and what she can gain from them in knowledge, experience, and conversation. If she could have an insightful, educated, stimulation conversation with a pig farmer, she would. Of course, I doubt all of the people she met in high society were able to keep up with her intellect any more than her family were, but then few people could. Her IQ must have been extreme, but that's part of her behavior as well. Her mind went faster than anyone around her. Her energy and curiosity and intellect could not be matched by anyone of any class. So, on that level, she exuded the same energy regardless of where she was and who she was with. Her servants had a purpose, and she expected them to do their job. Her acquaintances, friends, and families as well had their purposes in her life, and she expected them to fulfill that purpose for her. When any of them failed to meet her expectations, she got frustrated and annoyed in equal measure. At least, that's how she comes across to me. I love that. Yes, I, I, I love think it's that uh, way of seeing things. Exactly. And she became frustrated with herself also mm -hmm. when she let herself down. I think she demanded the same standards from everybody, even, including herself. Yes, or uh, starting even with higher herself. higher starting with for herself. herself. Yeah. Uh, and she just, she just didn't, uh, you know, brook fools. She just didn't have any time for, for people who. Couldn't and she keep had that up. kind of energy that was constantly on the go. I mean, when I see her walking. The, the way that she walks is so fast because she just want to get she where just, she's going. You know, she doesn't <laughs> care about what she's looking at, what the beauty around her. She just wants to... She has a goal. She's very goal-oriented. where she's going and do what she's yeah. there to do. Um, I love this little tidbit from Julie. Um, Upon managing Shipton Hall and other properties, Anne would threaten her male tenants with eviction if they did not vote on land use issues as she wished. Um, and actually, that's... Uh, an, an, a couple of you pointed that out to me that uh, in the first episode there was a lot about the, the right to vote. She was so frustrated that she didn't have the right to vote that she demanded that the people, that her tenants yes, who did have the right, her. yes, have the right, uh, use their right because she was so upset that she couldn't. Um, another thing, uh, one last thing that uh, some of you also said regarding the, her attitude and being a snob and, was that she did originally a couple of you kind of saw it as like preyed on Anne for her money, that that was her original intent in, in the, you know, in wanting to be with her. But again, I will quote Sarah saying, ultimately, having not yet read any of the books, my understanding from interviews and excerpts is that the real Anne loved Anne in her way. She was the only woman to commit to her. And as I understand it, they pleased each other well. But Anne having money was no doubt why Miss Lister chose her in the first place. And while this series is entirely based on the journals, which themselves are biased, lest we forget, because they're written from her perspective. <laughs> from her point of view, yes. Sally Wainwright had to create a cohesive, logical story arc using her own interpretation of the journals, reading between the lines as she sees it, while fitting in the while filling in the gaps. And we also have to remember that as much as it's based on fact. Again, uh, Sarah reminds us it's it's a, only one point of view. Exactly. You and have to fill in the blanks. Of course. I mean, I was just thinking about it when I saw when, when we were watching the last episode and we saw the uh, the talk between uh, Anne Walker and her sister. A Anne wasn't privy to that talk. No. If anything, she may have you know heard Anne Walker told, telling her about it. But so she already was once removed from the actual conversation, and then 
uh, and uh, Choma had to read it and transcribe it, and then Sally had to read it. I mean, you know, you have to create. Well, she's a, a dramatist, show. And so, exactly. You, you have know, to fictionalize. She, you have and to it was uh, those those aspects of uh, the show are also brilliantly done and of a piece. I mean, it, it, it couldn't be more perfect. It, I agree. It, it just blends all of it. I mean, uh, the young man who had to murder his father to save his family's mm, yeah. life. She didn't know any of that. None of that was uh, that all. I don't know. I don't know how much. Or maybe there were. Maybe Anne did maybe, write about it, yes, but to a degree. Rumors, I mean, yeah. Or maybe she when it was know the details and the buckle. Exactly. You have and, to. Yeah. You have to. That's the part where you are a dramatist. You're a yes. writer. And so you're, when Sally says that she lifted much of the dialogue right out of the journals, yes. I'm sure that they were, that was very helpful to her, but she herself had to create a great deal out of whole sure. and uh, it was magnificent. Now, before we get to the finale, uh, a couple of people had requests for next season, so uh, Carla said she wants us to do a weekly podcast when the second season comes, and Lily oh. says, for the second season, can you please consider doing a show like Talking Teal for all the Gentleman Jacks fans? I can submit some ideas for the name of this new vlog. So... Gentle Anne Talk, Hat Talk, Fast and Hat, Shift and Talk, and my favorite, Walk and Talk. I love Walk right? and Talk. Walk and now, talk. now, usually, I, this is my, uh, my bailiwick, my uh, great talent. I ran a magazine for uh, 11 years, and I think I wrote every headline, every title in the magazine. I like Walk and Talk. But I like Walk and Talk. The only thing is, does that mean we have to move? No. Around what no. we know. <laughs> okay, the finale. <sighs> How much did we love that finale? Okay, so first of all, we had to have a screamable moment, and to me, that was the thermometer. No, oh, I'm no? talking about the finale. Oh, the finale. <laughs> well, there were so many screamable moments. Feathers in hair, walking into the ball, and just first of all, the way that Saran does Anne in femme clothes is, is hilarious. It's genius. It's genius. The discomfort, the awkwardness, the... I mean, she goes... She doesn't even express any kind of um, uh, she, uh, discontent in wearing them. She understands yes, that she, she needs has to. to. She, she has expressed discontent in having to do it. Well, I don't, but, I don't uh, remember any, like, really... Uh, she, she, it's not something she's trying to defy. She understands that... Day to day, she can wear whatever she wants, but there are certain occasions when she has to yes. be in a dress. And well, she wears a, she wears a skirt. She doesn't yeah, wear yeah, but trousers. I mean, like the frilly, you know, mm -hmm. the colorful, the, mm -hmm. and the feathers in her hair. Um, but that, and also when she when she uh, goes to talk to the queen when she's presented again, the way she just walks straight, straight. up. Right? <laughs> and bows to some lady in waiting yeah. or something. Yes, I, I just love the fact that she and she mentioned, "Oh, I bowed to the wrong, or curtsy uh, to the wrong person." But oh, I think we could go. Out I there. loved her conversation <laughs> with the queen. Oh, it was I wonderful. It was fabulous. There were so many of those moments. Um, but uh, I love that they gave her the queen to talk to. I love that they gave her Sophie, who was a scream too. Um, I don't know. Sophie, Are we I supposed adore to think she's Sophie. Gay? Well, I think that. What we're supposed to assume is that about 80% of the women that Anne meets fall <laughs> in love with her. I guess it's true. That she's just irresistible. That, well, that not... conversation in the coach was also quite, you know, out there. Out intimate. I mean, yeah. Sophie had some balls. <laughs> uh, excuse me. Or a vagina. I, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, she was very uh, presumptuous, I thought, but it was very funny. And Anne, I think, rather appreciated yes, that. Yes, and then she took her, and then she took her spin. up for a spin <laughs> on the dance floor. Uh, I love that the thermometer made an appearance in the, in yes, the finale. Yes, quietly in the corner <laughs> of the coach. Um, I, I, I want to... Uh, quote Sarah about this uh, discomfort that she that uh, Ann Lister has in her costumes. Um, it is interesting to view Miss Lister in society now that we have a deeper understanding of how she navigates. First of all, her relation, her revelation speech to Anne the night before Anne left for Scotland, telling her how she rises above all the stairs and talks and talk about her, while being perfectly aware of what people think and say. 
then followed by Mariana's cruel suggestions that Miss Lester's friends are just using her for entertainment, to now see her practically squirming in her fancy dress at dinner with the elite of Denmark, clearly <laughs> feeling uncomfortable, yet we can actually see her rising above it and embracing their kindness and excitement for her, doing her best to take it all at face value and not question their motives. Her letters are filled with awe and delight at how well she's being treated and what fun she's having. This is her way. Grab the world with both hands and make the most of every opportunity. Yet, she still can't hide her broken heart to everyone. First Sophie, and then the queen cluing into what is underneath her smile. Very good. Very beautiful. Um, then, uh, beside, okay, so say what you want to say about the screamable moment, because it's, it's so Well, perfect. it's just, again, it's one of those uh, fourth wall moments, and it's so subtle that really, if you happen to go like this, you miss it. Which you did the first time. Exactly. <laughs> we had a we had a rewind. I rewinded for you. Because uh, I, I started screaming. As they're walking into the church, and just turns to the camera and goes, I did it. We're here. We're walking into the church. Yes, I'm getting married. Just, we, you, it you really came, was only You came a with few me on this seconds. journey. You came with me on this and, journey of this and, season, and look, we made it. Yeah, it was fabulous. <laughs> look at me now. <laughs> oh, I screamed. I screamed. Um, but really, uh, perfection again. Just perfection. A subtle, fleeting moment of perfection. I agree. Um, and then, of course, we had a perfect, typical rom-com, pretty much arc of, a, of an ending to oh. a love story, uh, complete with starting with uh, coming to whisk the bride away uh, and take, you know, for her to follow her true love, follow her heart. Um, I loved Ann Walker's growing sister. a backbone. Oh, yes. No, her growing a backbone. Yes. As soon as she heard that Anne had asked after her and had written with love and affection and and uh, immediately in pages of things. Advice, yeah. It just like snapped her back to life. Well, I think that and her, she had to... And her discussion with her sister about what what was in store for her if she stayed. Well, first of all, I love the sister, played by uh, Catherine Kelly. Wonderful. Uh, Elizabeth. And I love the sisterhood, literally the yes. sisterhood. And uh, her, her husband, uh, Sutherland, represented the patriarchy, represented men and what they oh, wanted out of the, For him to say, you know, what a, a, a woman having babies is not... And I love, by the way, that they did that, that they made it a point that not all women want to have babies, straight or gay. Um, and uh, that he thinks that a woman's fulfillment is to have kids. And, 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 and when she begged to differ, his wife, who had had the children, exactly, he said, oh, no, no, no. Yeah. It's like, what do you know? But he really did. That it's, one, it's, it's like the Republican legislature's... Uh, <laughs> uh, that, that one character, all men. Though, that one character represented all of patriarchy. And she, she had to go through this process of, of, after years of knowing but not really knowing... And then realizing exactly what it is that she has been feeling all this time and what's been bothering her and making her sick and becoming more sick until she could rise from that and decide, you know what, this is not, I don't want to feel this way. I felt so good with her. Right. This is not well, worth she it. She had to, again, this often happens, hit bottom and yeah. try to commit suicide. Yeah. yeah. I love that the Priestleys came to fetch her. Uh, I love that she became the, all decisions. Amelia Bullmore, I just know. Adore Even in this her. small role, she's oh, just so but wonderful. she shines in yeah. everything she does. Uh, I love that Anne was like, every decision made about me from now on is going to be made by, by me. me. <laughs> Um, uh, the fact that Anne arrived back home just in time. I mean, again, you can't make this shit up. It's it's a rom com Perfection. trope, but, but it was but it was it true. It, but it was but it really do. happened. Yes. But it really happened. That's the thing. It was it was a rom com that actually happened in real life. The fact that they, she got there just in time for Anne to come back. Uh, the, of course, the and scene. Thank goodness her aunt wasn't really ill. And her aunt didn't that even have to die better, for that. that she, yes, that she uh, got better again, and it's real reality. Um, and of course, the scene on top of the the, the By pit. The pit. Uh, oh. First of all, the scenery, the views, the stunning uh, Vistas, backdrop yeah. that they had to, for this scene. It was it was like Heathcliff and Catherine, but it was Catherine and Catherine. <laughs> Jane, 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 Jane. Um, 
the fact that uh, I, I have to I have to put this in the fact that uh, because she was still disheveled from her trip, her hair was done oh, for the she occasion. Was so divine. <laughs> Thank goodness she didn't she have didn't those have for the uh, for the for the, of for the big hair. moment. Um, and of course, the wedding, which was juxtaposed juxtaposed uh, with the other wedding, um, uh, uh, the the heterosexual couple, showing us lending more uh, validity uh, to the sacrament, to the the ceremony that they had, Themself showing two quietly. yes, two weddings but equal. Um, I love that. Uh, it was, of course, the first lesbian wedding in history, as far as we know. I mean, it wasn't actually a wedding. Uh, but for her to have this concept that she could yes, marry, marry another, another woman, woman exactly. I mean, even if it, even if the the laws were not, or even, no, if, she, even if they didn't have somebody preside over, it doesn't matter. Wedding. The fact that she conceptualized in her mind she could have a and marriage. The sacrament with together yes. was the uh, I now pronounce you wife and yes, wife. Yes, exactly. And of course the day afterwards go on to have a typical married couple oh, band that <laughs> conversation as they walked off into the sunset was just hilarious and charming. So charming. Oh I love it. And it was it. just again in case they didn't have a second season, it just gave us a little snippet of what their life was gonna be like with and fully in her own now, coming to her own, and uh, Anne Lister, of course. And I love, I, I love that Anne, re you know, realized, hmm, okay, she's got some guts. Oh, yeah, she, she has, has a lot of guts. Yes, you've certainly come. Not just a pretty yes, face. Yes, she's all right. You know, she wanted to move in immediately, and Anne Walker wanted to do it a little bit more in stages and not make the announcements too soon, and she explained that to Anne. And she's supposed to whipping her a little bit. Okay, you know, she's just sort of keeping her in line, not letting her run over her. Because and we Anne know that Anne can do that, not, not even trying to run over anybody, but just, just because she's so forceful. Yes. yes. And uh, I liked Anne realizing, hmm, well, this is going to be much more fun than I thought. This is going to be much more than I thought it was. Um, summing it up again, Sarah, the fact that the Gentleman Jack finale provided all the romantic cinematic cliches that are common in the heteronormative world in, in this love story between two women, I challenge any gay woman not to cry their eyes out over it. We don't get those sappy cliches until now. We got the happiest, most joyful, and most gorgeous happy ending sequence of any lesbian love story I have ever seen. I agree. And uh, Carla says... I loved, loved the ending, showing them as a normal married couple. Wonderful to see Anne Walker know her own mind and not be led by Anne Lister too much when discussing when she should move in. Yes, because she <laughs> has to be able to keep up with Anne to a certain degree, well, you know, or Anne will become bored with but her. But you know that Anne has a backbone because she the fact that she hadn't married all yes. these years, she stood up, she stood up to her family trying to marry her off here and marry her off there and have her money, you know, have her give her money to this person and that person. She did have a backbone. She just broke over a very specific thing that is a very crucial thing. Exactly. Um, but just finishing up, Anne Walker seemed like she has grown so much as a person. When she, when they saw each other for the first time at the pit, she looked confident and content. Yes. I agree. Uh, and it, it and in contrast, Anne Lister was the vulnerable one. Yes, don't was hurt the me. soft one. It, it was, uh, I love to see that uh, role mm -hmm. changing. Yes, uh, I think they're a good match. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, your love of the show has uh, elicited a lot of and inspired a lot of fan art, and I was wondering why a lot Great of it, fan art, and a lot of it was drawings and paintings, and I wondered why. And I just looking at the show, I mean, it's it's it begs for it. Every scene, every every frame looks like a piece of like art. A painting. So, exactly. so it's no wonder. And thank you to any, everybody who sent us uh, their contributions, uh, starting with Lily, who sent us the. Um, uh, a little bit of a graphic of the iconic hat. Yes, that was fun. There it is. Um, Catherine sent us a drawing, a beautiful drawing, and I expressed her thanks to Saran, Sophie, and Sally Wainwright. Um, Mariana sent four gorgeous, uh, again, it's kind of like, I don't know if it's a graphic art or digital. I mean, it's digital. She does it with an iPad, but it's just fabulous. fabulous Sensational. Fabulous. And I'm so glad that um, a Sophie... Uh, that Ann Walker is being included in so much of this because really and truly she is magnificent and sort of gets a little lost in the shuffle yeah, because, because, uh, because, Saran, because Saran, Saran and Ann Lister are just so overwhelming. Yeah. 
Uh, but she holds in her own. In their presence. She, she really, really own. does. It's a beautiful performance. And again, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful kind of balance to Anne. She's very yes. different. And they Anne. have lovely chemistry. And she was able to do such a range between uh, being kind of like somebody that we at first thought was just this, this innocent, maybe not that smart girl, and then to both show that she has a lot of substance and break and show us this emotional... Um, right. Uh, vulnerability. Heartbreaking, yeah, vulnerability. It was, it was stunning. Yeah. It was a truly stunning performance. Very virtuosic. Um, Andrea sent us three gorgeous drawing drawings. Thank you, Andrea. These drawings are also amazing. Who did the charcoal? That's uh, Andrea. Oh, Andrea. Yeah. Bravo. Uh, Janelle sent us a drawing as well. Gorgeous, beautiful. Thank you. Uh, Gentleman Jack AL from Twitter, by the way, a fantastic uh, Twitter account. Follow it for like nonstop Gentleman Jack stuff. Uh, Gentleman Jack AL. AL. Mm -hmm. uh, sent us a beautiful graphic. Uh, and um, Amy <laughs> sent us fantastic pictures of herself made up as Gentleman Jack. <laughs> brava, 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 Amy. You make me look. More ridiculous <laughs> already because you did such a great job. And, and, her and she had real hair to, yes. to do it with as opposed to toilet paper rolls. I love it. Um, I'd like to mention uh, Julie, who is an artist but did not make it in time. Uh, but she did send a whole lot of information about Anne that even though I couldn't quote here because it was uh, practically lifted off the, the book uh, and it was copyrighted, uh, sure helped me get a more a, a better understanding of Anne and I love having that uh, information um, f especially for this rap party. She actually like binge binge read it or audio read it or whatever it was to get it in time for you the party. You audio read, you audio, audio listen. Binge, yeah that's what I mean. And Bridget who is a wonderful artist who started working on a pastel drawing in a collage and then hurt her hand Ended up, uh, well, she, she doesn't have, uh, she, she has like a contusion and a very, very deep. So we didn't see the so, partial. So she couldn't, f no, she couldn't finish we'll it. We'll show it. Yeah, once done. you're done, Bridget, please send it over and I would love to share Absolutely. it with everybody because will, uh, uh, it's such a shame and, and I hope you feel better very soon. Yes. Um, now, before you get to your contribution, just because it's a little long. Very long. How long is it? It's, it's, I'll read fast. Okay. Uh, I just want to give my contribution, which is uh, a picture of all of my diaries. I started writing when I was six, and I'm pretty sure I have more than five million words by now. Uh, uh, the contents of which are very, very different from Ann Lister's diaries. Yes, they are. Um, but, but if anybody yeah. wants to dramatize my life, please don't wait until I'm dead. Please come, come over. I'll be happy to, to, to absolutely to collaborate. I, I'd like to live to spend the money that we'll, we <laughs> that we'll make. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Now Mimi's contribution. Okay, I wrote fanfic and I have never in my life ever ever written never fanfic. ever ever never ever 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 <laughs> written fanfic I, uh, I I tried to do it in the spirit of the time and um, I picked something specific and uh, when I'm through with it I'll just have a little comment to make okay. and I hope you'll enjoy it um, I worked very hard on it she but very did fast. which she enjoyed yes she I enjoyed because I haven't enjoyed. written anything in ages and I am after all a writer so it was kind of fun uh, it's called Eat Your Heart Out, Cinderella. Anne felt very much like a fish out of water. Said she to herself with some <laughs> irony, I look like nothing so much as a preternaturally large swan in this getup. She wasn't totally wrong. Instead of her signature impeccably tailored black suit, she was wearing a billowing white satin ball gown, cut rather low in the front, showing off a tiny bit of a usually hidden decolletage. In her hair, she wore a pair of white feathers, not her famous black top hat. But in spite of her sartorial discomfort, she was excited to be at the D Danish Queen's birthday ball, where everyone was dressed in white as per the Queen's instructions. Anne enjoyed the company of aristocracy, as she herself held a keen kinship with them. And she was tired of being sad and cross because of Anne Walker's rejection. Life goes on, she said out loud to no one in particular. She put on her dazzling smile, took a deep breath, hitched up her skirt slightly, and strode purposefully, as was her style, into the ballroom. Miss Anne Lister of Shibden Hall, Halifax, England, announced the page. All eyes turned to her, some with curiosity, but several with a smile of recognition. The Danes were delightful and unpretentious, and she had many friends in the room. They weren't nearly as judgmental as the rather provincial gentry back home in Halifax. Even dressed as a large white waterfall, she, fowl, she felt welcome. 
The queen, who had invited Anne personally, caught her eye and smiled. and nodded ever so subtly and made a tiny curtsy. Didn't you have some white feathers here? Oh, I day? did have some white feathers for a bit. Well, you know, we won't do them. Anyway, I did have a pair of white swan feathers, as it turns out. I collect feathers here on the island. Then she was suddenly summoned with an enthusiastic wave and a call of, Anne, over here, come join us. I have someone I'm eager for you to meet. Anne strode briskly to the small group of her friends, but before she reached their midst, she stopped short, unable to move. Standing with them was a stranger, a woman so magical and heart-stoppingly beautiful that she looked like a unicorn among common thoroughbreds. <laughs> she was dressed in a white satin fitted jacket over a sheer lace blouse with a high ruffled collar. The blouse revealed a tantalizing glimpse of what was underneath, the curve of her breast almost unbearably beckoning. Below, she wore satin breeches under a satin skirt open in the middle. Her raven curls surrounded her exquisite face and tumbled in ringlets to her shoulder. A stunning diamond barrette held a clutch of curls to one side. Anne couldn't breathe as the two of them locked eyes. All she could hear was her heart beating like a drum in her ears. Everyone else disappeared. Time stood still. Suddenly, fingers snapped in front of her face, and her friend's husband, Bjorn, asked, Where have you gone? You looked miles away. I don't know exactly, Anne replied softly. I had a sudden, sudden, surprising glimpse of paradise. Her friend Marina laughed. Oh, Anne, the way you have such a way with words. Come back to Earth so I can introduce you to a dear friend from England. She turned to the vision on her left. Lady Sarah Churchill, may I introduce you to Anne Lister of Shibden Hall in Halifax. Anne, Lady Sarah, is at court and is a close advisor to Queen Victoria. Trying desperately to gather her wits, Anne smiled and extended her hand, her white gloved hand as they were all in, ensconced in white kid gloves. It's a pleasure to meet you. Lady Sarah took Anne's hand and while looking deeply into her eyes, kissed it. The pleasure, I assure you, is mine. There they stood, hand in hand, their friends chattering around them about what neither could fathom. They were lost in a dream for two. Anne was the first to finally speak. Lady Sarah, she said directly, would you like to dance with me? Sarah smiled, dropped Anne's right hand, took her left in hers and said, I thought you'd never ask. They laughed and as the two walked out to the middle of the ballroom floor, Marina turned to her husband and said, that went rather well, don't you think? <laughs> Bjorn replied with a smile, as if you had any doubts that it would. On the dance floor, Sarah put her arm around Anne's waist and pulled her in a little too close. Anne draped her arm around Sarah's neck, took the other hand in hers, and the two began to glide to the romantic waltz the quartet was playing. They moved together like one around the floor, Anne's usual awkwardness disappearing under Sarah's protective and self-assured guidance. Sexual tension surrounded them like a cloud. Sarah pulled Anne even closer and whispered into her ear, I've been waiting for you all my life, and I didn't even know it until you walked into this room. Then I'm so glad I came, Anne replied as her lips brushed Sarah's ear. The music stopped, but the two women didn't move. Would you like to get something from the buffet? It's sumptuous and exotic. Or if you prefer, we could go to my rooms, and I can show you my beautiful etchings hanging on the walls. They're quite remarkable, said Sarah. I heard that line before. <laughs> My tastes tend toward British fare, Anne replied with a mischievous twinkle in her ear, in her eye. <laughs> <laughs> Anne replied with a mischievous twinkle in her eye, and I do so love beautiful things. Sarah smiled knowingly as Anne uncharacteristically blushed, her skin turning a becoming pink from her decollet decolletage to her forehead. The two women walked slowly hand in hand off the dance floor and then quickly up the stairs, leaving, for those who might have noticed, a trail of stardust in their wake. Oh. But even as desire coursed through Anne Lister's body, her mind kept whispering over and over, but you love Anne, Anne Walker, Anne, Anne. It remained to be seen that even as her body cried yes, would her heart in the end cry, no, I cannot, I love another. Why, as they reached the top, the door of Sarah's suite, Anne looked at the magnificent, exciting woman at her side. Why, she said to herself, could nothing ever be simple? Oh, thank you for keeping them together in the end. Well, actually, that was my I rendition. Know, I, know. I had stopped with the trail of stardust in their wake, and I thought, 
but is this truly in the spirit of no. our story? And I decided, no. We is still don't faithful? know. We still don't know what happened when she went into the room to look at her etchings. But and they, her were, etchings. and they were what a pickup line. Wanna come over of course, and look at my well, etchings? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't by accident. And uh, of course they were, you know, separated. There was no reason to think that they would uh, ever be together again. Uh, and Walker basically said that. But we know better than that. But we know better than that. So Thank I you. added my addendum. Well, if, if you guys want uh, more of Mimi's fanfic, you'll have to really harass her to write You will more. have to really harass <laughs> me. But it was fun. Okay, now to the survey responses. Um, these were really fun. And let's start with our favorite moment or line of the season. And um, the first ones that I'm going to read out are various variations on the same theme. So, don't hurt me. I'm not as strong as you think. Well, I am, obviously. Sometimes I'm not. Uh, the scene at the top of the hill where Anne finds Anne at the end of the last episode. It was so wonderful how all the pretense was dropped. Anne was totally fed up with everything and everyone. And Anne was finally sure and steady and ready. Just lovely. And how often as viewers do we get a scene like this that isn't followed closely by some kind of tragic ending? Like Such a treat. Anne falling off the edge of the <laughs> And the scene on the hill and the wedding, it's a payoff for the heartache, uh, ours and theirs. I love and only love the fairer sex. One of the greatest lines ever written, and I think somebody already has it on a t-shirt. The last kiss, the first, the first kiss, and the scenes leading up to that kiss. What a slow wind up and burn with such delicious deliberation. Would you like to come for dinner and stay all night? And that is why this, for me, is wrong. The entire I want you to be my wife speech. And now, Mimi, what is yours? Uh, well, mine is, as, as everyone else's. Uh, when Ann Walker tracked down an emotionally and physically exhausted Ann Lister at the side of the coal pit to tell her she loved her and wanted to marry her, Lister says, don't hurt me. I'm not as strong as you think I am. Well, I cheated a little bit. I have, I have a couple. So first of all, one of my favorite lines have to, has to be thought I to myself. I tried to add something like that. <laughs> I also love the, shall we go upstairs? <laughs> but of course, my favorite moment has to be when Anne walk, when Anne walk, when Anne Lister looks straight or gay to the camera as they walk into the church. Again, we talked about this, just giving us that little exchange of intimacy of, we're here, we have arrived. You see? Yes. That's my favorite moment. Now let's do our uh, funniest moment or line of the season. Uh, starting with variations on, obviously, the thermometer. Obviously, the thermometer. <laughs> the thermometer scene, hands down. Thermometer gate. Yes, I'm a bit odd. I like to have my thermometer with me on holiday. It's not illegal. <laughs> The emotional support thermometer was the best. I want one ASAC. Emotional ASAP. support thermometer. That's a good one. Like a service thermometer. Like, like a, a service, service dog. Yeah. <laughs> Ann Walker. What are you looking at when Ann looks at us through the fourth wall? The fourth wall with Marion is great. I love the fourth wall. And Sally Wainwright wrote that in wrote that in before Fleabag. To anybody who said right. that she stole it from Fleabag. So there for all the critics who knock it as a knockoff. And First I just of want all, to mention people have been breaking the fourth wall since Shakespeare. Exactly. The flea bag did not invent it. Sally Wainwright did not invent it. It's a thing. <laughs> I love when Ann Lister was getting ready to take her trip and she was saying her heartfelt farewells to her aunt and on the way and on the way out, taps and gives, gives her sister noogies on the head. They love each other very much. I love Marianne as a character. Me too. Dyke stomping in a Femi white dress through a crowd at a royal ball is the point where I laugh the hardest. Yes. What is your favorite? Well, of course, what is my favorite? And cl the, the clutching of the giant thermometer by Ann Lister in the throes of an escalating argument with her <laughs> ex and the coach. It's not illegal! Uh, it, it had to be mine as well. I mean, you just, I just, that moment was one of the best moments ever on television. It's iconic. Uh, most devastating moment or line of the season, and this is again variations on the same theme. Theme, but I want to uh, first quote it. Season one, episode six. I understand why you can't commit to me. It's impossible. I know. How could anyone? What am I? 
Every day I rise above it, the things people say. I walk into a room or down a street, and I see the way people look at me and the things they say, and I rise above it, because I've trained myself to, not to see it and hear it, until it's become second nature to me, and I forget just how impossible it is for someone else to accept that. But you came so close. I'm still crying while writing it. It's just perfection. <sighs> It was especially heartbreaking for me this because there's someone, right? someone else. It was especially heartbreaking for me because I've recently gone through that. No more straight women. She put LOL after that. I'm not putting an LOL. No more straight women. That's heartbreak, heartbreak, heartbreak. For sure. Agonizing. I had to flog myself senseless to recover from it. <laughs> well, interesting uh, Reaction. way of uh, recovery. <laughs> yep, this one gets me every time. Saran is such a powerhouse. And that one, se that one sent me to the ground, metaphorically, not melodramatically. It took me a few days to get out of a, a weepy funk because of it. And Lister says, I'm always all right. You're going to have to make a decision discussion in Anne's bedroom, specifically the words from Anne Lister's diary. I care not. It was only a game while showing Anne's tear-stained tear cheek. Both actors were wonderful. I love and only love the fairer sex scene with Ann Walker. Devastating because in one speech she explains sexuality in a way that is logical, persuasive, and perfect, especially from a religious and also a human perspective. The best defense I've heard, not that loving women needs defending. Thank you. Ann Lister, I want you to be my wife. Have some courage, Ann. Ann Walker. I would rather die than people know what we do. I can't do this anymore. It's wrong. It's against God. It's repugnant. It's queer. When Anne tells Anne not to let others poison her against her, against them. The entire monologue at the end of episode four, and I knew, I knew it wouldn't be five minutes. I'm, I, I think this is the, the rape when she tells, when Anne Walker tells Anne Lister about the rape. Oh my God. So devastating. Okay. And mine. Did I say mine? Oh, yes. Go on. Say yours. Oh, of course. The same thing. When Ann Lister excitedly proposed to Ann Walker and was turned down by Walker, who admitted she couldn't live a life of ostracism as an outsider. Mine is the confession in bed of how unconfident she truly is under all the charade of being so confident. And also, though, um, I have to add, because nobody else says it, said it, um, Ann Walker's whole story of her breakdown, her hearing voices, oh ultimately her attempted suicide uh, was devastating beginning to end and uh, wonderful performance again. Okay, who would you most like, who do you most like as Ann Lister's girlfriend? So the responses were unanimous uh, for Ann Walker, but I wanted to add a couple of explanations from people as to why they chose Ann Walker as the perfect girlfriend for Ann Lister. Anne is the best suited for her. She has a kind, genuine soul. She honestly and truly loves her. She just was fearful and frightened, and who could blame her? It's 1832, for God's sake. I know people who are frightened today to live their true heart. Exactly, so all the more reason exactly. in the 1800s. Anne Walker, despite her mental fragility at times, was more than able to temper Anne's impulsiveness. They balance each other quite well. Anne's protective nature often overrides her otherwise vulnerabilities as Anne gets under her skin. It does indeed. Anne Walker meets every single requirement Anne has. Willing to marry, that's established early, admires her, looks up to her, always speaks highly of her and never tears her down, except that one devastating time. Is happy three, is happy to say so to all and sundry and happy to be seen out in public with her. Four, up for sexy times. Inexperienced, but certainly willing to learn, which makes up for a, a lot of inexperience. Five, high femme, pretty, never vulgar. <laughs> Thanks for that. Who's your favorite scene partner for oh, Anne? Said, of course, I said Anne. Oh, sorry, sorry, Doesn't yours. Matter. Yes. I said Anne Walker, of course. I don't even know. Who oh, yes, of course, Anne Walker, of, of course. But the spunkier version of hers in yes. the end. Um, who's your favorite scene partner for Anne? At number one, we have Anne Walker. Very close second, Marion Lister. And third, Reverend Ainsworth. Oh, my goodness. I love that. Who's yours? Uh, mine is it, it, the same, uh, minus Reverend Ainsworth. Uh, it was, Anne was, of course, first, Anne Walker, and Marion was second. I love their chemistry. I, they are yeah. adorable together. And, of course, um, Gemma Whalen. Gemma Whalen is so divine. And I, of course, have loved her uh, 
for so long since Game since of Thrones. Game since of I started Thrones. watching Game of Thrones two years ago, for so long. <laughs> well, but I watched it intensely, didn't I? Um, uh, she's wonderful and, and charming, and she loves her sister in spite of the fact that she makes her crazy. Well, I have a different answer, though. I also love, of course, both her, her reactions. I would have chosen all of the above if I could have. Uh, but I love her interactions with, with her, her aunt. aunt. I knew you were going to say that. You did. You know me so I well. Did. I just love how supportive and loving she is, and accepting she She's is of her. So and kind. I, and I love. And I just told you when we were watching, when we were rewatching the second episode, when she gets the letter about her aunt being aunt being not a good. Uh, condition and she immediately comes back that was it. and I said I, I'm so happy I love that she's the kind of person who would do that so I love to drop everything and go yeah in the middle of oh winter across the North across sea. the North Sea uh, I nearly threw up just saying yeah. that and of course Gemma oh, Jones rage at the doctor I know. oh yeah Gemma Gemma Jones is wonderful so wonderful also as the grandmother yeah. in Rocket Man by the way yes and she was also she also played uh, Ann Lister's aunt. In right, the original, the original, not the, the, original the first, the, first, the yeah. uh, Diaries of Miss Ann Lister with yeah. Maxine Peake, which yeah. I love that she's reprising her role. Yes. Okay, what is the one thing you loved most about the show? Does everything count as one thing? <laughs> it was the perfect balance between comedy, angst, and romance. True that. Start to finish, the most important story of marriage is an institution I have ever seen. Also, the special circumstances of lesbianness being a liability in regards to reaching for happiness, but you can still get there if determined. It's the first honest and truthful representation of a butch lesbian I've seen on screen. Perfectly delivered. The pure, unadulterated, unapologetic butch energy of Anne Lister. It's conveyance, Anne's really... Aren't we lucky to be alive, to have a life? It was very inspiring, and a happy ending was the best ever in my life as a lesbian. It's unapologetic and new, it's unapologetic and nuanced treatment of Anne Lister's life. I love that this wasn't and didn't become a lesbian drama, but a drama based on the life of a flesh and blood, living and breathing woman who loved women and who was not afraid to turn everything on its head. Patriarchy, gender roles, what it means to be a woman. I love that the message and performances are perfect for right now. Anne Lister's life feels contemporary. The true representation I felt as a former closeted code diarist <laughs> and previously devout Anglican who always wears black, craves travel, and female companionship. Mm. Only difference is Anne's family accepts her, which I found utterly moving, seeing as my own family are fundamentalist evangelical Christians who sent me to reparative therapy when I was young. Well, I know I can't make so up sorry. for it, but the lesbian and the gay community, the LGBTQ community in general, are very good at replacing or at least trying to substitute for family when one's family rejects them. So we hug you and we embrace you. And Many people have families that they have chosen rather than chosen those families, they are yeah. born into and there's nothing wrong with that. The accuracy and staying true to the actual diary entries. I know that technically she does not count as a thing, <laughs> but obviously Saran Jones. What was your answer? Uh, what was my answer? Let's see. Uh, That's not your answer. Oh, where is my answer? Oh, okay. You're okay. so messy. Uh, Saran Jones. And the answer is Saran Jones. Her performance, her charisma, her brilliance, her beauty, her immersion into the role. She breathed vivid and thrilling life into a woman, Anne Lister, a lesbian and liberated woman completely ahead of her time. Her combination of strength and vulnerability. That's beautiful. Right, thank you. Mine is, can you see this? Here. <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's. I think it's. I think it's done. Then. I think it's. I think it's uh, unanimous. Yes. <clears throat> I mean, there was so much to love about this show, but truly, it comes down for me. To, if I had to choose just one thing, Saran, I, I don't. Mean, it, I don't think the show would have been the same without her. No. With somebody else. I, I can't it. even imagine it, and I've tried. Yeah. You have. I have. I have, and I and everybody falls short. Yeah. Um, Saran just magic. It just, it's just it, it meant was to just be. meant to be, yeah. absolutely. It's like all her life, everything that she's done before prepared her for this role. And it's like, it took Sally so long to make it because it had to be just right. the right, right person, the right combination of things. Yes. Um, was there anything you didn't like about the show? Not a single thing. The brevity of the show, but hopefully with at least season two ordered, that won't be an issue. 
Uh, does the people who don't like it, sh who don't like the show, count? I didn't know that anybody was out there that didn't like Me the show. Either. We haven't. Anyway, they haven't been brave it. enough to tell <laughs> us. <laughs> I had a really hard time believing the passion and authenticity behind Anne and Anne's early kisses. They felt too chaste, too hesitant. I understand that these characters would be nervous, especially Anne. Uh, I think she means... Yeah, Walker. Walker. But that's not how it read for me. It seemed to me like two actresses who hadn't kissed other women before being a little awkward about it. It took me out of the scene every time, but it definitely wasn't enough to make me dislike the show or ship them any less. I, I didn't feel that no, way. No, I tend to disagree. I think that the degree of awkwardness and tentativeness at the beginning was absolutely as it should have been uh, and, it, and would have been. Uh, the passion later mm -hmm. was very intense. Once they became Ann Walker, became comfortable with the idea of it, and should we go upstairs? And, and <laughs> you know, was thoroughly turned on. I I can't imagine uh, them throwing themselves into a highly passionate tongue and twine. And don't forget, yes, at that very. And, and I am very, very, very aware. You are. You're very sensitive of straight to women playing, which I'm. Uh, by the way. Uh, all fine, four. <laughs> all four. Uh, lesbians, when the kiss time to kiss comes, and they do, you know, the other thing is, is that there is a certain um, screen kiss that is that men and women do also yes, that good. looks best in the camera, the sort of one limb yeah. on top and the other kind of a thing, <laughs> uh, which is you know because uh, many love scenes are practically pornography now in, in film. Uh, they they've thrown away that. It's a, sort of an old Hollywood trope. But um, I'm very aware of that and it often takes me out of a, a, a scene. But not in this case. But all. also let's not forget that uh, the first kiss is, first of all it was Anne Walker, certainly it was her first experience, and Anne Lister was pretending that it was her first experience. Remember, she told her, have you done this before? Well, she, like, no, she said, maybe no, once. No, I, 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 thought, I thought of it, but no, I haven't done really? it. Really? Oh, I times. thought she did admit to maybe having tried something. Anyway, here's another one. No tongues, soap kissing? Come on, ladies, this is Anne Lister, Regency era sex expert. It's a choice made too often when telling our stories. I have as keen an eye for it as I do for A-frame hugging, which at least that was merc mercif mercifully absent here. So another person who didn't think the passion, the kissing was passionate. Now this is something I didn't know about. HBO cutting scenes out of the U.S. version, and I'm assuming they're also responsible for the show airing here weeks ahead of the BBC. So I'm sure that they're... Oh, this must come from... Uh... Well, why should they? I'm, a, I'm first of all, yes. It first aired on HBO before it aired on uh, BBC. I'm assuming that it because they probably gave more money. Uh, so yes, but I didn't. I wasn't aware of any cut scenes unless they were just scenes that were cutting the editing. I mean, the episodes were certainly long. Uh, they were a full, almost a full hour, I think. So I don't know if you mean that they cut scenes that made it into the BBC version. I find that hard to believe. I'm not sure if you want to explain. Um, and um, I wish they showed Isabella Tib Norcliffe, who is also a friend and uh, occasional uh, lover of Anne's. Uh, what did I have? Okay. Nothing. I had uh, some of this. Uh, was there anything you didn't like about the show? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, to me, that it's over, and then I now have to wait a whole year for another season. But I didn't. That wasn't something I didn't like about the show. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, sum up the season in one word. Uh, why don't you give me a whole bunch of words and I'll give you a whole bunch. All right. B-R-I-L-L-I-N-T, oh, three exclamation <laughs> points. Brilliant. Delightful, profound, groundbreaking, awesome. Phenomenal. To quote Saran Jones from an interview, life affirming. Unparalleled, fabby, maybe from fabulous? Yeah, I think and so. And tears. Yours was? Oh, yours. Oh, mine was uh, exquisite. Very good. Mine was perfect. Uh, now some of the, the season finale in one I word. tried to keep to the rules. One word. <laughs> uh, especially romantic. I know that's two word. Epically. Words. Romantic. Epically, what did I say? Especially. Oh, sorry. Epically romantic. Perfect. Fulfilling. Emotional. Phenomenal. Best. Breathtaking. A gift. Actually, two words, sorry. Victorious, lesbianorious. <laughs> I like that. Happy, thrilling. Okay, what's yours? Mine was again, one word, perfection. Very good. Mine is meaningful. 
because it had so much meaning to me besides the fact that it was wonderful and great it had it, it was really truly meaningful to the community and it was. I appreciate that let's have a kiss oh Mwah. and we love each other and there were no tongues involved <gasps> ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay Here's a fun one. If you could add any uh, actress to the show, who would you cast and for what role, existing or made up? Gillian Anderson is always a good idea. I agree, always a good idea. And I would like to see her in a 19th century dress. Well, I think you can if, uh, what was it, The Age of Innocence? Uh, uh, she's in a, a movie where she's... Really? Oh, yes. Okay, she's look it brilliant. up. brilliant. I think it, it, I don't, it's not The Age of Innocence, but I can't remember what it is right now. I'd love to see Jodie Comer join, but I have no idea what role she'd play. Someone who spars with Anne Ideal. As long as she doesn't play a murderous a psychopath, murderous okay? Psychopath, right. Okay. Uh, um, okay. Huh. She tells Chef from I Can't Think Straight, either in real time or flashback, is Anne Lister's first love, Eliza, the daughter of a British doctor and an Indian woman. Hmm. Tatiana Maslany, any role, something humorous, flirtatious with Lister. If I and I say, add perhaps twins. <laughs> <laughs> if I may say, Tatiana Maslany, any role, and she can do any, any role. role. Janet McTeer would be a real coup, but I'm still trying to decide who she might play. And of course, Dame Emma Thompson, a made up role, a lifelong friend of Ann Lister's. They grew up together and trust each other and know each other well. She is straight, but has always been Ann's defender and friend, no matter what. And yours? Can anybody guess, perhaps from my uh, fan fiction, and I'm so glad no one else said it, Rachel Weiss, as a character much like the one she played in The Favorite. And in fact, I made her the same character <laughs> she played in The Favorite. I'd like to add her retroactively as someone Anne Lister had a fiery, fiery sexual affair with while she and Anne Walker were estranged. Ooh, okay, so basically so a fan fiction. I guess they did it. It's basically yes. a fan fiction. I threw in the the last part just to, so that nobody would yell at me. <laughs> I don't like to be yelled at. So, how to choose. Um, and I haven't figured out the logistics. I know it's a bit tough to figure it out, but I would cast Wendy Crewson since I love my Wendy, in a series of flashbacks as young Anne, Anne Lister's first lover, a woman, her senior, teaching her the ropes. Uh, and uh, it, it, she, she has to be played by Sarando, not like a young right. actress playing young, young Anne Lister. I wanted to be Saran. So, as I said, haven't figured out the logistics, but it's a fantasy, so that's right. what it's about. I think Rachel Weisz and Saran Jones would have sensational chemistry. Sally Wainwright, if you're listening, please consider. We know that she doesn't have a problem playing a lesbian. Okay, if you could pair Anne Lister with any lesbian character from any show or movie, old or new, who would it be and why? Uh, nobody wrote little fanfic scenes, but they wrote the general yes. idea. Yes. So, uh, Cosima from Orphan Black, because of all the science. Makes sense. She'd be totally under Anne's spell, and they could extract <laughs> brains together. <laughs> now, that's her. a show you would like to see. <laughs> Uh, Jasmine from Las Estrellas, Argentinian telenovela, because they're both unabashed about their sexuality. Jasmine could cook for Anne and compliment her femininity-wise, and they both and they're both world travelers. I want to see this uh, show. I love Argentinian Sounds telenovelas. Like rock on. I, I do speak a little Spanish. Oh. Vita Sackville West, <laughs> but I guess that isn't a character. So how about Brienne of Tarth? <laughs> so she's not identified as a lesbian, mm, but we all. I think she could swing. Way. I'd pair her with Aurora Al Alarcon from Spanish telenovela Ses Hermanas or with crazy pretty doctor Luisa Alver from Jane the Virgin. Just think Anne would know how to woo them. I would like to bring Anne Lister to the modern era and pair her with Ronit Curtis. Or Ronit Krushka, another um, uh, Rachel Weisz character, this time in Disobedience. Oh. I think of her as Ronit Krushka. Not yes, Krushka. It absolutely. As long as it's... Rachel Weiss, Rachel you don't Weiss, care. <laughs> being a lesbian, I don't care. I could see them living downtown in Tribeca, Ronit working as a photographer and Anne owning a gallery, both very involved in local politics. Then Anne becomes more politically successful and becomes New York State governor. Oh, please, while well, we're living there. Okay, what was your answer, by the way? Oh, well, who do you think my answer was? 
Uh, well, I repeat, <laughs> I would pair her with Rachel Weisz's Lady Sarah Churchill from Fa The Favorite. They are of the same kind of women, strong, assertive, ahead of their time, beautiful, intelligent, lesbians, and look fabulous in male-tailored clothes. Um, that's it. Okay. And they do look fabulous in male-tailored clothes. I have two versions. One is contemporary, <clears throat> with Anne being part of the reboot of The L Word. <laughs> and... Um, my personal favorite. I would like to see her in Tipping the Velvet, velvet in a Love Triangle with Kitty and Nan. Oh, yes. <laughs> Forget about it, Nan. <laughs> well, I like the idea of the Love Triangle. I would triangle. like to just see her with Kitty. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, basically, uh, Kitty, uh, uh, Kelly, Kelly Haw is doing anything. Yes. And oh, that Kelly would be Haas a great doing... addition. Why didn't we think Cass of Kelly Haw? Cass Kelly Haw. Okay. Yeah. We well, you, know, you and I discussed this uh, separately at we one have point. So I think many... after we watched uh, Summer, Summer Rockets. Rockets. Yeah. Okay, if you could spend an afternoon with Anne, not Saran, that would be an entirely different afternoon for you girls, I know. How would you like to spend it? Swapping stories about our greatest loves and losses. Planning trips abroad, sharing tales from former adventures, and gazing at ladies <laughs> passing by and discussing them. Huh. <laughs> I would like to hear all the stories of her adventures, her travels, her encounters, her lovers, her sorrows, her exploits, while walking through the English, English countryside. Do you really think you could keep up? Just saying. It's a thought. <laughs> I'd love to follow her around Halifax while she power walks Again, away. another one. To collect, <laughs> collect the rents, engages in social calls, and puts misogynistic men in their place. Like well, actually, you just have to watch and pretend you're there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I would like to have breakfast with her at Shibden Hall. The food always looks good. And then walk the estate and listen to her tell me about its history. I'd like to hear about that baby ah! dissection in detail. You are a sick puppy. <laughs> and uh, we had two uh, that said, in bed, of course. What was yours? Uh, horseback riding in the mm. English countryside. Oh, nice. A glorious picnic, some romance al fresco. The horseback riding would assure that this was the only one afternoon, as I probably wouldn't be able to walk <laughs> afterwards for about a week. Uh, I would just like to sit down for a conversation with her and absorb as much wisdom as possible. That's I'm I'm just a geeky like that. Yeah, just a romantic, and I love horses. <laughs> okay, um, what do you hope to see in season two? More in-depth looks into Anne and Anne's relationship beyond courtship, and maybe more scenes of Anne's travels. Well, I think that's something like that we're likely to likely see. to see. I want to see them grow stronger together as a couple, and I want to see how they rise above the def the defiance and dis disregard of the society. Go, girls! I would love to see the everyday life of women in love. I never tire of that. Domestic ands. <laughs> no trip to Russia. Maybe in season three. I want to see Mariana Lawton's reaction when she finds out about their wedding and the fact that little Miss Walker had the courage, love, and respect to accept Anne for who she was. That's a good one. More adorable sex scenes. Cute married bickering travel adventures, both Anne's kicking arse for each other and just because. Oh, and more of Mrs. Priestley butting heads with Anne because Amelia <laughs> Bullmore and Saran Jones work brilliantly together. They're used to butting heads. Yes, they are. <laughs> Uh, would also love to see Anne Lister accidentally trashing a painting of wet shirted Mr. Darcy <laughs> and not giving a fuck. People are very specific, aren't they? Yes, they are. A differing, a different ending for Anne and Anne than what happens in real life. Not looking forward to watching that. Hopefully, we have lots and lots and lots to go before that yes. comes about. What's your response? Uh, Anne and Anne learning to be real partners. Anne Lister's family adjusting to the addition of Anne walker to their household the gradual acceptance of the town after some initial disapproval the successful sinking of the coal pit and Anne's complete and utter besting of the despicable rawson despicable rawson brothers i would like to see marion make a brilliant marriage to a rich kind man who she loves and who cares for her very good who loves her actually Mine is Anne, uh, the Anne's married life. Uh, maybe some flashback to Anne Lister's younger self, her figuring out who she was, uh, her journey to become the strong woman that we know her to be now. And I would love some flashback scenes to her romance with Vera Hobart, Jodie May. Yes, because mm -hmm. I, I liked uh, v Vera. Yes, and I love Jodie May, and yeah. that would be a nice, mm -hmm. a nice thing to see. If Anne Lister lived today, what would you like to see her do or be? 
but she definitely would be a public figure, an active and influence, influence advocate for the LGBTQ plus community and women in general. I would love to see her as a Hollywood power lesbian and entrepreneur, like a way more butch Ellen. CEO of travel company or a senator. Okay, now this one is extremely specific, and somebody obviously has a beef with something. Transport secretary, she'd sort out Lee's pathetic lack of a modern transport system, something that the council has systematically failed to do. She'd also, having finally embraced machinery, scrap HS2 and sort the UK out with awesome maglev trains. There's cholera at Wibsey, you know, no time to waste. Oh my goodness. Whoever understood all these references, let me know. <laughs> Doctor or astronaut? With her fascination with anatomy and the human body, I could totally see her as a brilliant world-class brain surgeon. And finally, President of the United States of America. Please. Uh, what was your answer? Uh, my answer uh, was, let's see if I can find it, okay. Uh, oh, I would say President of the United States, but since she would be a naturalized citizen. She can't be president. <laughs> oh, you were the fact. Well, what can I say? <laughs> I guess British Prime Minister for life will have to do. She would also be a best-selling author and secretly writes, oh dear, wildly popular lesbian romance <laughs> novels under the pen name Lucia Lusmore. Why Lucia Lusmore? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, I am sorry. I'm selfish. I don't care how it happens. I wanted to be president of the United States, even if they have to change the laws for that to happen. If it didn't happen, then maybe we can start our own LGBTQ nation, maybe on the Isle of Lesbos, and she could be our queen or our president or whatever. Well, if we do end up with two separate countries, she can be countries, ours. Right. Yes, we can. The enlightened states of exactly. America. Exactly. The enlightened states of America. Now, if Ann Lister can hear us wherever she is, what would you like to say to her? You are my heroine. Thank you for always being yourself, unapologetically, authentically, and passionately yourself. Thank you, and even though you weren't perfect, you're a hero for, of time for me. That we love her. I wish she could see the amazing response her story is getting. That she is a huge inspiration and her lesbian spores <laughs> are giving us all strength from beyond the grave like some supernatural power fungus. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely how Ann Lister saw herself as a fungus. <laughs> and thank you for recording your diaries. Thank you for your bravery to your commitment to live your truth. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You are an inspiration. Thank you so much for writing. Your religious understanding of your true nature, faith, and honesty to yourself are truly an inspiration. I can't begin to express my gratitude for the prolific and detailed records you kept of your of everyday life from the 1800s. It's a real treat for the history buff in me to explore everything from the mundane to the more scintillating entries. Thank you for having the courage to be true to yourself and live life to the fullest. I have no doubt that your diaries will inspire many generations to come. I'm definitely walking a bit faster, haggling more confidently, and maintaining my optimistic outlook on life. Anne Lister, you are a rock star in any era. Okay. Something that has touched me significantly from the diaries and that Wainwright touches on by showing the scene where Anne is beaten up and by her I rise above its speech to Anne is the harassment that Anne Lister faced. From the diaries it seems pretty ongoing and prevalent and though Anne does rise above it she's hurt and humiliated by it. Yet she persevered. What a testament to so many. So what to say to her? I'd say, I'm so proud of you for your spirit, your commitment and loyalty to your true self, which in that time was miraculous. You didn't have a script to go by. I ache for what you must have gone through. I am so grateful to you. I grieved when I read about your death, even though it was 180 years ago. It was personal. And you look very gay, very ladylike. I see you. Yours? You are an inspiration to women and especially lesbians everywhere. Your bravery, intelligence, and refusal to be anyone other than who you were make you an icon and figure of feminism to which we all should aspire. Thank you for your diaries and for your life. I just want to say before I say my entry, um, what I have to say to Ann Lester is I'm, I'm, 
I'm kind of spiritual when it comes to these things. And I do hope that Anne is watching us. And if she is, then it is, uh, I consider it a great privilege to be able to share your messages with um, Anne Lister. Thank you. I know the world didn't know your story until very recently and long after your death. But even with no one consciously knowing, your conviction of self and the truth of who you were and the beauty in it rippled through the world and through the LGBTQ community all the way to today and beyond. I think a whole generation of people, gay and straight, has a new role model to be inspired by. Excellent. Now do you have a message for Saran Jones <laughs> and or Sophie Rundle and boy do you have messages. I don't have enough words in English or in French, I guess you can guess who that is. Yes. To describe the performance you delivered to us, it's brilliant, amazing, astonishing, beautiful, wonderful, magnificent, sad, funny, romantic, devastating, hopeful, beautiful, right, authentic, superb, perfect, majestic. It is just true art. Thank you for that. Thank you both for taking the time and obvious, obviously making the effort to make these portrayals sexy and arousing without being pornographic male gazy, and for the sincerity of the relationship and portraying the drama without appearing trite or ridiculous. Both, thank you so much for pouring yourself into these roles. You were perfect. The love you have for the story and your characters is apparent, and thank you. Thank you squillions to both of them. Their incredible portrayals of these women will stay with me forever. Saran is racing toward the status of national treasure. I expect to see her shoplifting in Waitrose with Judy Dench any day now. I can't wait. Does, does Judy shoplift? Dame Judy? I don't know. Thank you both so much for portraying these lovely historical lesbians with such dignity and poise. I sincerely can't imagine anyone else playing these characters. You are both true allies to the LGBTQIA community. In all honesty, I think the universe was properly aligned with the decision to cast these two. I'd say to both, thank you. I'm pretty sure the show is what it is, and to so many because of their deliberate, thoughtful performances. To Saran Jones, your Ann Lister is historic, and what many have called a force of nature. I love that you seem as affected by Ann Lister as we are. You both have such great chemistry together, and in addition to that, your respect and commitment to these women and their story makes all the difference. Then to Saran specifically, your emotional commitment and dedication to portraying Ann Lister respectfully, honestly, and adoringly is a testament to you and your craft. I thank you for that. When so many people are watching, the lesbian community really needs someone like you to help us show the world that love is love. Thanks for very respectful portrayal of these two women. Thanks for all the support and being allies. Thanks for being kind and patient with us. Thanks for thanking us on your Instagram posts. Those were next level performances. I've never seen anything like that. To Saran, I don't think there's anyone who could have played Anne more perfectly. You truly did the character justice. That's your message? Again, <laughs> so many papers. Saran, no one else could have played this role. You brought Anne Lister vividly and brilliantly to life and made her a woman we all fell in love with. Your talent, beauty, and intelligence, and that walk, embodied all that Anne was. Sophie, you created a woman waiting to be let out of the cage of conformity to perfection. You balanced Anne's delicacy and strength to perfection. Mine is, the LGBTQ, the LGBTQ community is very touchy when it comes to representation, you may have noticed. But that's because we've had decades of terrible experience. Just ask Sally. Uh, you ladies could not have made our community prouder. Thank you for the love and care that you've put into these characters in this story. You are forever enshrined in the Lesbian Hall of Fame, and you are a part of us for eternity. Finally, do you have a message for Sally Wainwright? Keep up the good work and hire Saran in everything you make. I second that. <laughs> Thank you for your commitment to Anne Lister, to her story and her diaries. It's meant a great deal to me. Thank you for your commitment to writing Anne as authentically as possible. Thank you for being unafraid to depict a character as deeply human as she truly was. Thank you for never giving up on this project while also being patient with it. Thank you for sticking with this project. I know it's been a long time coming. 
Sally is one of our finest television writers ever, and I can't think of anyone better to look after Ann Lister's story. Thank you for making this story. I'm inspired. I feel better about myself. And your show has made me want to do better for myself, live more fully. Heck, I even want to visit Halifax. First of all, thank you so much from the bottom of my lesbian heart. I am by no means a religious person, but I feel totally blessed to have, have, have such meaningful, authentic representation of lesbian love and relationships on TV. Having just barely scratched the surface of the diaries myself, it's mind-blowing what you've managed to accomplish with Gentleman Jack. The talent and creativity needed to transform abstract diary entries into a cohesive narrative that our modern sensibilities can understand and appreciate is astounding. Even though I'm currently riding the high from season one finale, I still have a hard time wrapping my head around the fact that this show actually exists. <laughs> what a beautiful gift you have bestowed on the LGBTQIA community. I can't thank you enough for bringing the wonderful Ann Lister to light so we can all celebrate her remarkable life. I love you. Well done. I know you've wanted to make this for a long time, but I would have been devastated to see we've come exactly zero steps on marriage, which you and your co-writer Ann Lister have rightly scoped as the essential keystone to relationship progression. It's best to have it now that we've crossed that finish line. Now we can look back and see how far we've come. Kudos for this outstanding piece of art. Now, back to work for season two. And please, let them be happy together. What's yours? Your oh, message mine. to Sally? Uh, Sally. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Gentleman Jack is your crowning creation of a career filled with highs. I know you don't claim to be a lesbian, so I'll just <laughs> leave you to that delusion. What? You sure you want to put that in? I'm putting it in. Okay. <laughs> I mean, how can anybody who doesn't have feelings for women write? Well, I think she loves women, that's for All sure. Right. But maybe, maybe not romantically. All right. But yeah. that's fine. All is forgiven for the terrible missteps of Last Tango in Halifax. You have redeemed yourself in spades. Mine is apology accepted. Whoa, is it accepted? Best making up ever. <laughs> and finally, uh, only one person sent a little uh, fanfic plot summary to share, and it's Anne and Anne exploring polygamy, sorry, polyamory on their travels and with friends and how that affects their relationship for good and ill. Hmm. Well, with that... <laughs> yes, well, I have already read you my fanfic yes, yes. in No, I don't have a fanfic. I, I was too busy working on everything else to write a fanfic, but I love that you shared it with us. And thank you for joining us for this wrap party, celebrating this wonderful, wonderful show. Thank you for watching a whole vlog of us looking, looking like Amish people. You look lovely. <laughs> I, nothing wrong with Amish people. I, no, I, I look a sort of, of like a, a, a preacher uh, or no, a, well, George Washington, a barrister George Washington or George Washington. Um, hope I that, don't have my black clothes here. They're all in New yeah, York. We, yeah. Uh, we hope that on this Monday when normally we'd be, we would be watching Gentleman Jack, we helped ease your um, rehab, uh, your, uh, your, uh, your yearning and craving. Yes, your craving. Uh, um, withdrawal. withdrawal. That's the word I was looking for from Gentleman Jack. Hopefully we won't have to uh, maintain this condition of dry drunk uh, from Gentleman Jack for too long. Um, can't wait for and may I suggest watch it again. From watch it again. I'm sure that you have to end. You know, the audiobooks and the performances of uh, Ohuli and Tito and I'm sure you, you, you'll go visit Chibden Hall and binge on anything Saran has ever done. And yeah, that yeah. will be really fun. And, and uh, Sophie Rundle too. And Sophie Rundle she too. She has a body of work. Yeah. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for going through this journey with us. And we can't wait to see you again. Well, we'll we see you soon. We'll see you soon but anyway. But Ray, gentlemen, Jack. Yes. In next season when, you know, we'll consider doing, we'll consider doing something. We'll, we'll consult with you all and see what you think we should do. Okay. We love you. We love you, gentlemen, Jack family. And we'll see you soon. Au revoir. Bye. So uh, thought I to myself. Thought I to myself.